Welcome back, everybody. This is Earth and Space Science 102. Um, I'm Stephanie Welch. Today is our eighth uh, lecture, our, our eighth video, and the close of the whole segment on weather and climate. So, so far in this unit, we've talked uh, just at least in a small amount of detail about everything from hurricanes to tropical storms to mid-latitude cyclones to tornadoes. Um, and the last few lectures we've been talking over longer periods of time. We've been talking instead of weather, we've been discussing climate. Now, in the last video, which is really crucial to watch before you watch this one, uh, we talked about uh, natural mechanisms for climate change. We talked about all of the ways that the Earth uh, has to affect its own climate and how that's worked over certain time scales. Most of these are going to be over really long time scales, tens of thousands of years to millions of years. Today, we're going to get into man-made climate change. And I realize this is a fairly controversial topic, but I'm hoping that after I uh, go through all of this today and after you've had the chance to, to, to watch all this today and to see all of the data for yourselves, that you're going to find that there is a lot less controversy than most people want to make it out to be. It's pretty cut and dry, very uniformly accepted scientific principle that the Earth is warming through our own processes and our own fault. So today is all about anthropogenic, which is just a fancy way of saying human-influenced climate change. Now, compared to all of the natural mechanisms for climate change that we talked about in the last video, man-made climate change is extremely simple. So while in terms of natural mechanisms for climate change, you have everything from plate tectonics to the tilt of the Earth's axis to volcanic activity, all affecting climate and all doing so over different time scales, the only real way that we have been able to affect climate and we will be able to affect climate into the future is through changing the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. Some people would suggest that it's uh, really crazy that we could even think that we have the potential, that we have the capacity to change the Earth's atmosphere and to change climate. But we do absolutely have this potential. We have done it in the past and we will most likely continue to do this in the future. So I think it's very, very important and very critical that everybody understands exactly what's happening. Now, most of the Earth's atmosphere is composed of a range of different gases, mainly nitrogen and oxygen, that are considered non-greenhouse gases. When heat through rays of light come into the Earth's atmosphere from the sun, they pass around all of these particles, they're harmlessly transmitted around all these particles, and they warm the surface of the Earth. They're absorbed by the surface of the Earth and they heat up the surface of the continents and the surface of the oceans. Then the heat is given off from the surface of the Earth in the form of infrared radiation. Now, when those rays of infrared radiation move back past the, um, uh, the, the non-greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere, they are harmlessly vented back out into space. And so the Earth warms and the Earth is able to cool back down again. A very small percentage of the Earth's atmosphere is composed of greenhouse gases, and these are more complicated molecules, typically having more than one type of element in their structure. They're things like water vapor, which is H2O, carbon dioxide, which is CO2, methane, which is CH4. And as the heat that's given off from the surface of the Earth interacts with those molecules, the heat reverberates around their structure for a little while, thus trapping that heat in close to the surface of the Earth. Now, some amount of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere are absolutely crucial. If you could, just with a snap of your fingers, take all the greenhouse gases out of the Earth's atmosphere, we would have no way to stay warm over the nighttime cycle. Life on Earth would perish. So some amount of greenhouse gases are crucial, and some are there through really no fault of our own. Like, take, for instance, water vapor. Water vapor is always going to be actually the most abundant greenhouse gas in the Earth's atmosphere. 
Some are there through partial fault of our own, like CO2. Some amount of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere is completely normal and completely natural. But what we've done and what we will continue to do through the burning of fossil fuels like coal, natural gas, um, through the release of other greenhouse gases like methane, uh, through, through doing this, we're changing the composition of the Earth's atmosphere and changing the way that it traps heat in close to the planet. This happens to be the fastest way that you can affect climate. And really the only possible explanation for the warming that we've seen on Earth up to this point, about a little less than one degree Celsius of warming since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and what is projected to occur over the next century and the centuries to follow. So the biggest way, the most substantial way that we're affecting the Earth's atmosphere is through the burning of fossil fuels that releases primarily CO2. But certain processes that are used to derive those fossil fuels, like take for instance fracking or hydraulic fracturing, can also release the pure gases into the atmosphere. When you do hydraulic fracturing, you release potentially pure methane into the atmosphere. And methane is 10 to 20 times as potent of a greenhouse gas as CO2. And so all of these all affect climate in different ways. All are either greater or lesser forms of greenhouse gases, but they all do essentially the same thing in the end, and they retain heat in close to the planet. Now, we have other ways of creating this same effect. Take, for instance, the effect of deforestation ends up having the same total net effect on the composition of the atmosphere. When you clear forested area, what you do is you reverse the capacity of the Earth to deal with this problem. When you clear forested area, you're clearing away an organism that lives on the surface of the earth that has the capacity to take CO2 out of the atmosphere and replace it with oxygen. Through their natural metabolism, plants, any plant on the earth's surface can reverse the effect of, um, of warming by the introduction of CO2 into the atmosphere. When you clear away forested areas, you clear away uh, organism on the planet's surface that has the capacity to deal with this. The other big problem is that often when you clear forested area, the result ends up being in the end to burn off all that organic material, which again has the same effect. It introduces even more CO2 into the Earth's atmosphere. So deforestation is thought to be responsible for about a third of the CO2 emissions since 1750. So it's not just the burning of fossil fuels, it's the clearing and burning of forested areas that reduces the planet's capability of dealing with the increase in CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere. Now, of course, you already know this, that it's been really, really hard to get people convinced that this is definitely a problem, both because people don't really understand the difference between weather and climate, and people really want to deny that there's a problem here because it will involve a change in behavior of not just us here in the United States, but everybody on the entire planet, and a commitment towards um, fixing this problem. Now, one of the things that always ends up getting pointed to as a... Uh, as, as evidence against global warming is that if you get around really, really highly industrialized areas and big cities, that you actually see a decrease in temperature. You have little cool centers that pop up right around big industrialized areas. Now, anytime anybody shows any kind of video on climate change, ultimately you see a picture very similar to the picture at the bottom of the slide of these big smokestacks belching out all of this black stuff into the atmosphere. Now, CO2 and these other greenhouse gases that we've been talking about, like methane or even water vapor, are completely invisible, odorless gases. We could double or triple the amount of CO2 that's in the room right now at this time, and you would never know, except you'd start to feel really funny. You wouldn't be able to breathe as effectively. So what's getting pumped out of these big smokestacks is not CO2 or methane or pure greenhouse gases. What's actually visible are these things called sulfate aerosols. 
So in order for it to actually be visible, unless it's an actual visible gas, all of the smoke stuff coming out, all of the stuff is um, largely the result of combustion, the result of forming these sulfate aerosols. So these aerosols are little solid and liquid particles that become suspended in the atmosphere and in massive concentrations, they can actually reflect sunlight, um, do essentially the same thing that ash from a volcanic eruption does and cause a localized cooling of the Earth's atmosphere. So a side effect, uh, an intended side effect of all of this is that you actually do have some cooling going on around big industrialized areas, but those same big industrialized areas are pumping massive amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere that as a whole are leading to warming of the planet. Now, I wanted to take a quick second and talk about how the planet reacts to this increase in CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere and warming of the surface. The planet is capable of producing these positive and negative feedback mechanisms, meaning essentially everything on Earth is connected. And if you affect one thing on Earth, then that's going to affect something else. One of the things that gets affected whenever you start to increase temperatures on Earth is the rate of evaporation. Whenever you change the amount of CO2 concentrations in the Earth's atmosphere, this of course creates warming. Your overall air temperature, as well as surface temperatures, get warmer, and this causes more evaporation to take place. Water vapor is not as potent of a greenhouse gas as things like CO2 and methane, but it's still a greenhouse gas. So whenever you have more evaporation, you have more H2O, more water vapor in the atmosphere, which in turn acts as a greenhouse gas. So that causes more warming of temperature, and it's an infinite feedback loop. This is the same feedback loop that on a planet where you have an unchecked greenhouse effect like Venus has led to no liquid water being present on the surface of that planet. The warmest planet in our solar system is not actually the one that's closest to the sun, Mercury. It's actually Venus because of its incredible concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere and its capacity, limited capacity to have any kind of liquid on the surface of the planet because of a runaway water vapor greenhouse effect. So the effect of this ends up being in a positive direction. You increase temperatures, you increase the amount of H2O in the planet's atmosphere, and then you further increase temperatures uh, on and on and on and on and on. Another of these feedback mechanisms that's also a positive feedback net mechanism is called the snow albedo feedback mechanism, but it basically just means something very, very simple. Whenever you warm temperatures on Earth, through any mechanism, but let's say through the introduction of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere, you are going to start to melt ice. And having ice on the surface of the planet is actually really important in maintaining overall cooler temperatures, because ice on the surface of the planet is very reflective. Having anything that's really light colored on the surface of the planet, like ice, like the white snow and white ice, is very, very reflective. And so more heat ends up getting reflective reflected away from the surface, then it gets absorbed if you have ice on the surface. As soon as you introduce more CO2 into the planet's atmosphere, you have more melting going on, less ice covering continental areas, and the effect ends up being that you have a larger percentage of the Earth's surface that's darker in color and actually absorbs heat. So as soon as ice-covered areas are replaced by permafrosted areas and other uh, darker colored areas, even just a normal land mass or even the oceans, then you absorb absorb a tremendous mo amount more um, sunlight into the surface of the Earth and you cause more warming. So both this snow feedback effect and the uh, water vapor feedback effect are both positive. There are also negative feedback loops, but they aren't enough in and of themselves to completely mitigate our effect on uh, global temperatures and our introduction of CO2 into the Earth's atmosphere.
So the big story here is starting at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So from the beginning of the 20th century, from the year 1900, um, we have been affecting global surface temperatures, global atmospheric temperatures, uh, oceanic temperatures, every part of the surface of the Earth we've been affecting overall temperatures. And the overall trend has been in the direction of warming. So given the difference between weather and climate, of course, you're going to maybe have a cool year in the last 116 years. You may even have several cool years, but the overall trend, the climatic trend is toward warming. We've had a little bit less than one degree Celsius warming so far. But remember, it only takes four degrees Celsius plus or minus to tip you in and out of an ice age. So when you're talking in terms of climate, even something like a single degree Celsius of warming is extremely um, important. And it's nothing compared to what is projected to occur in the future given unchecked runaway CO2 emissions and more industrialized nations coming aboard and doing essentially the same thing that we're doing today and pumping more and more CO2 into the Earth's atmosphere. So this is what point eight degrees Celsius looks like so far from um, the year of uh, 1900 to 2016, from 1950 to 2016 is where you see the most substantial part of that overall warming. On this graph, that's the black line. The red and the blue lines are the projected increase in temperature going forward into the future. So it should be noted that all of this data, and this is the same source of data that I'm going to be using for uh, sea level change, is from the IPCC. That stands for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their 2013 report, which is the most recent report that I had available um, to, to do this to set of slides with. They're essentially not just a United States agency, but a worldwide agency that collects data from scientists and puts together a comprehensive report. So the entire report was enough to actually break my computer at home. I had a hard time actually downloading the entire official 2013 report. But there is a smaller report that I have available for you on Moodle called the Summary for Policymakers. It's essentially what um, state and federal legislatures and the president, this is the distilled version, the 26-page version that they're supposed to be reading that addresses all of the big um, causes and effects of climate change. Now, in that report, they refer back to different scenarios, and that's where all of these RCP 2.6 and RCP 8.5 are coming from. These are different scenarios going from this point today, or this point when the report was published in 2013, into the future, over into the beginning of the next century. So you can basically take it as a best and worst case scenario. And the blue scenario, the best case scenario, is essentially no more CO2 concentration increase in the Earth's atmosphere. It's completely, completely unreasonable. Uh, this is if, essentially if everybody turns off their cars today and everybody turns off their electricity today and there is no more bar burning of any kind of fossil fuels and no more deforestation. That's the blue line scenario. And even giving that scenario, the increase in CO2 concentrations that we've seen so far will amount to as much warming over the next century as we've seen over the last century. Now, the more reasonable scenario is the red line, and that's the one that I'm going to be um, uh, talking about more specifically, the RCP 8.5. This is given expectations going into the future of how certain countries are going to respond to the issue of climate change and how um, more industrialized nations are going to come aboard and potentially contribute to our overall CO2 increases. So that has us going up to potentially four degrees of total Celsius temperature change from the beginning of the industrial, industrial revolution to the beginning of the, uh, the 22nd century, um, to the beginning of the year 2100. So 
this in and of itself, global average surface temperature change, or even global atmospheric temperature change, or oceanic temperature change, really doesn't have a huge effect on us. And it's really hard to appreciate the changes uh, that will actually affect us as a result of these changes in temperature. So, you know, when you just think about it just from the perspective of surface temperature change, you think about going outside and it might be six, seven degrees warmer than it would have given um, no climate change. And you think, well, I, I, you know, I could maybe deal with that. I, I, I didn't really like cold weather anyway, so we'll even have less of a winter in Louisiana than we did originally. But it's the atmospheric impacts of global warming and the effect on the cryosphere, the ice on the Earth's surface, and the effect on sea level that we will feel most specifically. It's all of the side effects. It's having to think of Earth as an interconnected whole with all of these different processes that are dependent on each other. It's really important to remember when looking at the effects of global warming. So the first thing I want to jump to is the atmospheric impacts of global warming. A warmer atmosphere will absolutely mean more evaporation. More evaporation means a warmer atmosphere. It's that feedback loop that we already talked about. So there will be absolutely major changes in the amount of rainfall in places that are already very prone to it, places that are already very humid and already get a tremendous amount of rainfall, like the southeast of the United States and Louisiana in particular. In particular, we will be more subjected to catastrophic floods going forward into the future. Um, this also means that areas that were already fairly dry and arid, like the western part of the United States, will become more so going on into the future. And so your overall changes in precipitation patterns that originate as a result of this include more droughts, more limited access to fresh, fresh water and good drinking water, more floods, more forest fires that are um, unstoppable in places like Colorado and California, that this is going to become more and more common into the future. You'll never be able to just point out to a single event and call it the result of global warming, but the increase in the number of occurrences is absolutely the result of global warming. Now, the biggest one that's going to affect us here as far as atmospheric impacts of global warming is changes in the intensity of cyclonic storms. There's one thing that I really tried to emphasize in the first five lectures in this class. It's that any of these cyclonic storms, whether it be an upper-level low, a mid-latitude cyclone, or a hurricane or a tropical storm, they're all dependent on heat. Heat is what drives those storms. And so any kind of increase in atmospheric temperature means stronger storms and more frequent storms. Even upper level lows will become more intense and more frequent. Hurricanes, and the number of named storms and the duration of hurricane season will get much, much bigger. Um, so it could be 10, 20, 30 years in the future that every hurricane season might be like the 2005 hurricane season that brought us Katrina and Rita and many, many other named storms that didn't affect us here, specifically in South Louisiana. So the increase in um, the number of cyclonic storms and the intensity of cyclonic storms is an almost inescapable fact of climate change. The effect on the cryosphere, and that's ice on Earth, is one that is happening at the most alarming rate. Um, atmospheric temperature rises absolutely lead to a loss of ice, which is one of the is the second feedback loop that we already talked about. Whenever you lose ice, you lose a part of the Earth's surface that's very reflective and wants to stay colder. And so once you lose that ice, you're going to lose more ice because you increase temperatures as a result of having darker areas on the surface of the earth. So we are already seeing this happen today in both the loss of sea ice in some locations and primarily the loss of continental ice. The loss of land ice, the continental ice, is actually much, much more important than any increase in decrease or decrease in the amount of sea ice. Um, in a documentary uh, that um, the, uh, the uh, 
organization Vice put together as actually season three, episode one of, of this uh, um, Vice News. They did a special on the loss of land ice in the western part of Antarctica. And this is just one place on Earth where you're losing continental ice. But what's really strange in Western Antarctica is that you're actually gaining sea ice as a result of this. That doesn't end up doing anything beneficial to the rise in sea level that is going to be the absolute effect of global warming, because once you lose that continental ice to the benefit of the sea ice, the sea ice is going to just melt over time, and having an increase in sea, le- sea ice still raises overall sea levels. So I wanted to go ahead and we'll, we'll cut to a portion of that, that documentary where they were discussing um, both the effect of the loss of land ice in Western Antarctica and the effect on that in terms of global sea level and the, the difference between sea ice and, and land ice. So I'll go, let you go ahead and, and cut to that now. In order to see if their latest talking point is true, we took a step back to get the bigger picture of what exactly is happening into Antarctica. So we headed down to the bottom of South America to meet up with renowned glaciologist, Dr. Eric Regnault. Dr. Regnault is the lead author of the groundbreaking scientific paper, which has concluded that sections of the West Antarctic ice sheet are actually experiencing rapid melt. We caught up with him while he was observing glacial movements in Patagonia. We're here with Dr. Eric Regnault, and uh, maybe you could tell us exactly where we are. Uh, we are in the uh, Marinelli Glacier on the southern tip of South America. Beyond that is the Antarctic Peninsula. And so what's happening to this glacier? This glacier is retreating extremely fast, and this is not part of the natural cycle. In the last 10, 20 years, they retreated more than the past century and even more. Uh, it's like changing the limit uh, on the freeway right. from 55 miles an hour to 550 miles an hour. <laughs> OK. Just calved right there. These changes are staggering. We actually don't have any idea how fast some of these systems can react to climate warming. What the past 20 years of data are showing us, it's they are reacting fast. And so is this kind of a precursor of what's happening in Antarctica itself? This is a precursor of what's going to happen in the peninsula, in the Antarctic Peninsula, in Pine Island and Twaits. We're in for some real trouble with big time sea level rise. Now, when Dr. Regnault refers to Pine Island and Thwaites, he's referring to glaciers that form part of the western border of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. And the reason he's so concerned about the melting is that together, these two glaciers are nearly the size of Germany. Now, what's mind-blowing about Antarctica is just the sheer scale of it. It's gigantic. In fact, it's one and a half times the landmass of the entire continental United States. Now, because these ice sheets are so massive, one of the best ways to study the changes that they are undergoing is from the air. So Dr. Regnault invited us to the NASA flight station in Chile, where they conduct the largest airborne polar ice survey in the world. So we're here in Punta Arenas, which is otherwise known as Tierra del Fuego, El Fen del Mundo, the end of the world. And right here, there's the NASA Armstrong Flight Research Center, which measures the ice, which we're going to be going on a 12-hour flight going out over Antarctica. And we've just got clearance to fly. So we're going to go see what's happening to the ice in Antarctica. This is Operation Icebridge, a refitted DC-8 aircraft that functions as a flying scientific laboratory that tracks changes to Antarctica's ice. Dr. Michael Studinger, the project scientist, showed me some of the key technologies outfitted on the plane. This is an instrument that's called the Airborne Topographic Mapper, and it's a uh, laser altimeter. This is actually an incredibly awesome instrument to determine if the ice surface has changed just by five centimeters or not. And is it changing? It is changing rapidly. We see it changing uh, several meters per year over areas like Pine Island Glacier. That's a lot of ice. A lot of ice, yes. So today, we're going to fly out over Antarctica. Yeah. We're going to use the lasers and all the other instruments to just get data. Every day you're going out getting data. All right, guys, if you could listen up. Looks like we've got a good mission for today, and we can go through the uh, manifest. Fuller. Here. Cochran. Here. Rigno. Yes. Tinto. Here. Shane Smith. Here. There will be some winds on the route 
which is probably going to cause there to be some turbulence. You know, we're going to play the big boy program where if it's feeling bumpy, make sure you're restraining yourself. Also, uh, I do have uh, survival gear aboard the aircraft. Hopefully, we won't need to break it out. changes in Antarctica. This is the uh, mission director console. So the two mission directors are linked between the cockpit and the scientists in the back. So they control all the power. Uh, they communicate with the uh, pilots in the cockpit. This is running all the different stuff. Exactly, yeah. So we left southern Chile. Yeah. Tierra del Fuego, I touched it, sorry. And then we're going down over Antarctica here. Yeah. to measure the ice and snow. That's right, weather permitting. We fly very low at 1,500 feet above the surface, so we need clear conditions, both for the optical instruments and also for aircraft safety. Through the command center, they're able to coordinate the pilot's speed and altitude, along with the flight path to the instruments collecting the data from below, like this one-of-a-kind radar that can actually see under the ice. So this is a uh, ice penetrating radar system. Wow. And that is uh, very important because different shapes and different depths determine what the, uh, the melting rates are. And this is the uh, most sophisticated instrument worldwide. This is the most state of the art machine in the world to actually see what's happening under the ice. Now to record all this data as accurately as possible, the plane flies a fixed set of precise computer controlled flight paths. And today we're flying the Pine Island survey. And when we lower it down to 1,500 feet, which is quite low, you get a good sense of the vastness of Antarctica and just how much water is captured in the ice here. Now over Antarctica proper, I headed down into the belly of the plane where the bottom mounted instruments measured the ice below. So where are we right now? We're in the uh, forward cargo pit of the DC-8, and we're not going to fall out? Uh, no. I'm very confident we will not fall out. OK, good. I weigh a lot more than you do, though. So I'm not as confident. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty thick plexiglass. So. OK. How many shots are you doing as we fly? Each system has a laser that fires 3,000 laser shots per second. 3,000 laser shots per second, so it's pretty accurate. Uh, it's extremely accurate, specifically for ice mapping. Wow. Do you know why we're mapping ice? Yeah, we're looking for changes um, year to year. We have mines that we have flown since 1992, basically. And that gives us a very long time series of how that ice is changing throughout those decades. And how is it changing? And uh, it's retreating quite rapidly. Uh, it's losing a lot of surface elevation as well. Now, as the radar we saw earlier penetrates the ice and finds the bedrock bottom, the lasers accurately bounce off the surface of the ice. And the difference in readings that these two instruments give off is the actual thickness of the ice covering the ground. Now, this exact ice thickness turns out to be one of the most important measurements in Dr. Rigno's 20-year study. And what he's found is disturbing. We have the top machines in the world here. We just went through the whole thing. So there's so much data coming in here, flying daily flights. What's happening in Antarctica as a whole? Antarctica is starting to melt. Uh, we've seen uh, in the last 40 years, uh, a regime of westerlies around Antarctica that's stronger than for the past thousand years. So the winds are circulating faster around Antarctica. And this tends to push the subsurface warm water closer to the glaciers, and it brings more warm water towards Antarctica. If you keep that going, so you're going to push more and more ocean heat against the glacier. The glaciers are going to retreat faster and faster. So the winds are pushing more warm water underneath the ice shelf. You have the ice flowing faster into the sea, which melts it faster, which leads to sea level rise. That's right. Now, because so many of the glaciers in West Antarctica are exposed to these warm ocean waters, the ice sheets are starting to disconnect from the continent itself. 
And the primary way Dr. Rigneault was able to determine this is by tracking the unseen movement of what is known as the grounding line. So the grounding line, we don't see it. We, we just flew next to it. It's probably a little bit uh, to the right side of the wing here. Look, you can see here that the ice is fracturing. And what's that caused by? By a shearing of the glacier along the sides. So it tears the ice apart. I don't know if you appreciate the scale of these cracks, but these are big enough to swallow the whole ambulance. These are huge. And they don't necessarily like calve, like fall off. They just sort of break off and kind of keep going. Yeah, they detach into big pieces that drift and slowly melt. It's crazy. And what happens is the warm water melts the underside of the glacier, eating away and unseating the ice right where it meets the land. As the grounding line moves further back inland, the amount of unsupported ice shelf grows until it literally cracks off into the ocean. And as waters around the globe are getting hotter because of climate change, things are getting worse. In fact, in the past decade alone, glaciers in the Amundsen Sea sector have nearly tripled their melt rates. The retreat rate is enormous, a kilometer per year. I don't think that there are glaciers retreating that fast anywhere else in the world. Every year, a kilometer, it's, it's moving back. Wow. Now, it was at this point I began to wonder, if it's so clear that the ice is melting in Antarctica, why does the new climate denier script focus on Antarctica actually having more ice? What do you say to the people who point to Antarctica and say, actually, there's more ice in Antarctica than ever before? There's a little bit of confusion between the land ice and the sea ice. Right. They're totally different entities. The expansion of the sea ice in the Antarctic is related to the wind regime, which tends to expand the sea ice cover. The sea ice force people because they think if the sea ice cover is extending, maybe it's getting cooler than right, right. it's melting. Right, yeah. right. It doesn't work that way. So as it turns out, the same intensified westerly winds contributing to the melt of glaciers in the west of the continent are likely blowing and increasing the surface ice in eastern Antarctica. However, since it's seasonal, it's just the same water freezing and then melting again, just like a lake in wintertime, and therefore has no impact on sea level rise. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of the effect of the loss of ice on this whole process. But it's really hard here in South Louisiana to be thinking about loss of ice and how that's actually going to affect us. It feels very unconnected from us in South Louisiana, a place where it hardly even ever snows. So the thing that is going to be the result of this loss of ice and the increase in atmospheric temperatures is going to be the change in sea level. Sea level is very, very much tied to global temperatures. During ice ages, sea level is relatively low because you have a lot of water locked up on the continents in the form of the ice sheets. So sea level could be 100 feet lower during an ice age. What we have seen so far and what we will continue to see into the future is an increase in eustatic or global sea level as a result of raising atmospheric temperatures. And the reason for this is twofold. It's only partially dependent on the loss of ice from the continents, uh, from places like Greenland and, and um, Antarctica. So as you melt glaciers, as you melt continental ice, that water has to go somewhere. It melts off the continents and runs out into the oceans. So you have an increase in the total amount of water in the oceans. And as you raise atmospheric temperatures and raise the temperatures of the oceans, that water actually expands when it warms. It expands as it continues to warm, the only other process that causes water to expand is actually when it freezes. That's why ice floats. But if you're just looking at water within the point where it's in a liquid state, as you increase the temperature of the water, the water expands when it warms. So the effect of the um, expansion of this water is that it takes up a greater volume so if you increase the volume of water in the oceans, the effect of that is going to be that it intrudes, intrudes on the land a little bit, that you have an increase in sea level compared to the land surface. This is probably the most catastrophic potential effect of global warming 
from primarily our point of view, from humans, not even from the point of view of everything that we could do to every other species on the planet Earth, but primarily from our point of view as humans. Half the world's population lives very, very close to sea level. And we're part of that half of the world's population that lives very, very close to sea level. Even here in Hammond, even in places like Mandeville, and especially places like New Orleans, we are incredibly close to sea level. Now, the IPCC, in addition to uh, estimating the amount of atmospheric temperature increase over the next century, they've also compiled data on how this is going to affect sea level. And when you get to the end of this century and the beginning of the next, so the year 2100, we think that sea level could be anywhere from a half to a whole meter higher than today. So a whole meter is three feet higher than today. Then going forwards, going into the next century and the century after that and the century after that, sea level only continues to increase from 1 to 2 to 10 meters of total increase in sea level. And that will absolutely affect us here in South Louisiana. So I want to show you the end game of all of this the total potential of sea level to actually rise on planet Earth. And it's part of what I showed you in the last lecture with that National Geographic picture, what happens if all the ice melts. The complete capacity of sea level to rise is dependent on the total amount of ice locked up at the polar ice caps. And once you melt all of that ice, sea level can potentially rise 212 feet. And it actually has done so in the Earth's past. Back when the dinosaurs roamed the Earth, temperatures were warm enough and CO2 concentrations were high enough for sea level to be over 200 feet higher than today. So this is the picture of North America with a greater than 200 foot rise in sea level. And you already get a little bit of a taste for just how incredibly vulnerable just the United States is to a sea level increase especially one of this magnitude, but even one far less than that. Of the four most highly populated cities in the United States, three of them are very close to sea level. So the four most populated cities in the United States are, of course, New York City, Los Angeles, Chicago, and Houston. And three of the four of those, everything but Chicago, are vulnerable to sea level rise. Somewhat by the end of the of this century and definitely in future centuries. Particularly when you look down at what used to be Louisiana in this picture, it's almost hard to find out where Louisiana even used to be. Uh, most of it, even northern Louisiana, is gone with a 200-foot rise in sea level. In the last semester, in the 101 class, I showed you a series of pictures where you increase sea level incrementally from 5 to 25 to 50 feet with the eventual goal of 200 feet of sea level rise. So this is Louisiana in general. I won't even say South Louisiana because it's gone, but this is Louisiana in general after a 200-foot rise in sea level. 212 feet, and it's even closer to completely gone. Only very small portions of northern Louisiana and places along the Mississippi-Louisiana state line north of Baton Rouge and Hammond are still even there anymore. Now, I want to finish this by focusing our, our point of view on specifically South Louisiana, which is a really, really difficult thing to do because we have more issues that are going to be related to seawater intrusion and rise in sea level than just the global rise in sea level here in South Louisiana. There's a reason why scientists that work on eustatic sea level don't do this work in South Louisiana, and it's because the Mississippi River it makes things extremely complicated when trying to figure out how sea level is increasing and how the coastline is actually decreasing or sinking. People that do studies on eustatic sea level pick other places in the Gulf of Mexico to do their work, places like um, uh, the coastline of Texas or the coastline of even uh, Mississippi and into Florida. They tend to sort of stay away from Louisiana. 
But I did want to at least sort of briefly address all of these different things that are going to contribute to our complexity here in South Louisiana. Not only do we have rising seas, potentially a meter or three feet of rising sea level by the end of this century, but on top of that, we have coastal subsidence and the loss of wetlands that further contributes to our loss of coastline here in South Louisiana. And the big part of the story all goes back to the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River has really formed South Louisiana. As it changes paths over time, it builds up different parts of our coastline. But people didn't really like having to deal with those changes in the river and potential floods of the river that construct South Louisiana. And so over the years, we've levied the river and funneled it out to its current delta. And we've done this actually to the detriment of the rest of South Louisiana that doesn't have access to the silt and the sand that the Mississippi River has the capacity to deliver out to our coastline. So not only do we have to deal with rising sea level, but on top of that, the subsidence or the sinking of South Louisiana, which just compounds how sea level rise can potentially affect South Louisiana. So the Washington Post did a very good, somewhat short little video on um, our problems with coastal loss, our problems with wetland loss, how the Mississippi River plays into this, and of course, overall, how sea level rise is going to play into this, and some of the things that we're trying to do in South Louisiana to save our coast. So I hope you enjoy this little segment as well. Sea level rise, subsidence, saltwater intrusion, and the restriction of the Mississippi River, we will be kissing it goodbye. And we will kiss goodbye the culture and the vitality of the city of New Orleans. of New Orleans, including much of downtown, is underwater. The Big Easy's famous Canal Street, living up to its name. Katrina rising pushed water. a wall of water. And Katrina's wind speeds in New Orleans were 70 to 80 miles an hour. So we were not affected by wind, we were affected by water. You know, here we are, virtually 10 years later, and our flood protection system and hurricane protection system has an A+. Plus. The United States paid for a first-class system for the New Orleans area in South Louisiana. Coastal restoration, I hate to say, is a D. It's a barely a passing grade because it's been difficult to get the money. It's been difficult to spend money for coastal restoration versus flood protection. Hurricane Katrina, like the other hurricanes that have come and the other ones that will come, when they come ashore, they bring a lot of salt water in, they bring a lot of water height in, which is a lot of weight on the land, and it's got a lot of waves, it's jumping up and down, and so you get a salt water that kills vegetation that's not uh, adapted to handle the salinity. And then as that water leaves, you can also have a, uh, erosion. And so you have a lot of wetland loss associated with hurricanes. provide a lot of services, a uh, wildlife benefit, there's a water quality benefit. In New Orleans there's also the storm surge benefit and they do this by, as a, a hurricane pushes water ashore in front of it, 
that water has to get up to the inland and it slows down as it crosses a landscape like this. The uh, grass slows it. You know, when, it, when a hurricane or any event, any storm makes landfall, I mean, if the, the first thing it encounters is, is the coast. So it's important to have that first line of defense out there. Sediment diversion is taking the sediment and letting it out of the river. And that's the way southeast Louisiana was built. None of southeast Louisiana existed 10,000 years ago. But the sea level uh, slowed down rising after the end of the last ice age. The river was carrying sediments, and those sediments would flow out the mouth of the river because the water would spread and slow, and the clays begin to fall out farthest away, and then the river starts building closer, and the silts fall out, and the river gets even closer, and finally there's a sand cap on top. And then the river proceeds and goes, keeps on going beyond. But in the 1800s, people began realizing that they didn't like the flooding that came with that type of a landscape, and they wanted to grow crops every year. And so people began to serious, uh, successful efforts to levy the river and keep it from flooding. And so the river is now artificially isolated from the landscape that it built and maintained. But sediment diversions on the Mississippi River will allow us to build some land in areas that are open water. So hopefully that video gave you at least a little taste of the complexities of what we're dealing with in South Louisiana, partially related to the river, partially related to catastrophic storms, and to give you a little taste of how those storms affect our wetlands and can potentially affect our coastlines. I wanted to show you this before and after picture of the New Orleans region and most of Southeast Louisiana before and after Katrina. These pictures were only taken months apart, but you can see very healthy wetlands over here in the falsely colored green on the left-hand side. And over on the right-hand side, just months later, you see all of this light brown. And that light brown is the damaged wetlands as a result of Katrina and it's also as a result of the huge um, temporary increase in sea level as a result of sea level, uh, as a result of Katrina. Katrina, if you remember, brought with it a 21-foot storm surge that utterly decimated the wetlands surrounding New Orleans. When you do that, when you damage those wetlands, you damage the potential for those wetlands to act as a barrier and as a cushion protecting New Orleans and some of the more highly populated areas in South Louisiana. This picture shows both past and projected land loss in South Louisiana, and it's very, very targeted towards um, the area just south, just due south of New Orleans and due south of um, the Mississippi River in New Orleans. So this is all of the land loss that has occurred since 1932, and everything that's projected to occur up into the year 2050. So everything that has occurred so far and the next 35 years of land loss going forward into the future, everything in red is either gone already or will be gone in the future. And finally, I wanted to leave you with this taste of what we can really, I think, logically expect our coastline to look like by the end of the next century, by about 100 years from now. So I'll start off with this map of Louisiana as a whole, roughly the dimensions of Louisiana that we have today, and Louisiana after a five-foot rise in sea level. So the way I'm coming up with five feet here is from the three-foot rise in sea level that's projected to occur by the year 2100, coupled with coastal land loss and subsidence and the effect of these catastrophic storms. So I think a five-foot rise in sea level is absolutely plausible um, by 100 years from now. 
by your children and your children's children's uh, uh, reckoning and, and their version of Louisiana that they'll have to deal with. So if you notice in this picture, it, there really is no Lake Pontchartrain anymore. Lake Pontchartrain is just part of the Gulf of Mexico. And unless it's very significantly levied to where it basically is going to just form this man-made island, New Orleans is gone with a five-foot rise in sea level. Unless there is a, a massive saving effort, uh, we will lose New Orleans in a, an incredibly short period of time, as well as a lot of the rest of South Louisiana. All right, so that's going to wrap up not only these two lectures on climate, but our entire segment on weather and climate. And I know it's not a, a really a hopeful vision to the, the future. I know it's not a great note to leave you guys on, but it doesn't have to go down this way. It doesn't have to continue to be this way going forward into the future. This is all given unchecked global warming if we continue to bury our heads in the sand and continue to do nothing about it. So I'm really hoping that you'll take from this the knowledge that you are the ones with the power to do something about it and to change the course of history and to change conditions going forward. So it's a little bit harder than usual to, to go out on my, my uh, usual kind of catchphrase, but I'm going to be hopeful for the future. Until next time, keep looking up. 